My name's Simon Pont, um, and the title of my talk this morning, uh, When Fiction Bleeds. Uh, why the title? Why When Fiction Bleeds? Beyond uh, it being something I thought was quite catchy. Um, it's because once upon a time, you had fact uh, and you had fiction, and they were generally seen as being poles apart. And I don't necessarily see them as being poles apart anymore. That is, if they ever really were. Uh, but more so, uh, these digital days, I think fact and fiction are starting to loop back upon themselves in a kind of uh, dance or, or swirl, like a, like a double helix. Um, and in much the same way that you have DNA, which provides the building blocks of human life, uh, so too is fact and fiction uh, a similar double helix, I think. I think the building blocks of our reality uh, and in these digital days uh, where things are starting to move with such acceleration at such binary speed, this, this double helix is, I think, starting to learn all sorts of new dance steps and the potential is for it to be really quite supercharged. Now, fictions, stories, how they uh, build reality, how they inform it, how they infuse it, how they bleed into it, it's not obviously uh, a particularly new thought. Um, the Polish uh, writer and aphorist Stanislaw Lech um, observed quite lightly, rightly that all our, all our separate fictions add up to joint reality. All our separate fictions add up to joint reality. And this is an observation from the mid-20th century. Uh, but he could have been talking about social media. He could have been talking uh, about geopolitics. The uh, Cornell uh, professor uh, and political theorist Benedict Anderson describes nations uh, as uh, imagined communities, imagined because it's not actually possible for every nation member to know one another. A, a nation is an idea, it's a shared fiction under, under thought and flag, leading to a sense of, of a collective reality, if you like. And uh, I think it's probably a fair point that we could all agree on, that you know, the real world, the real world isn't just isn't just the, the hard surfaces and the, and the concrete forms. That's the physical world. Uh, the real world is about that which we experience. It's a, it's a formula, if you like. It's, it's the sum total of any and all experiences. It's that which we create for ourselves, and that's which, that's which others create for us. And digital, digital is allowing for new ways of experiencing things. Digital is now allowing for new outcomes and new realities. And certainly, we don't, we don't jog even the way we used to. We don't listen to music the way we used to. Uh, we don't socialize the way we used to. What we're fast becoming a, a residents of a digital state, a digital state which is transforming the physical world, which is transforming our reality, where you're having this, this happy collision uh, of the physical and the digital, and underpinned by all of this, and the way it's being informed is, as Stanislaw talks about, all these separate fictions, all these stories. Now, story uh, is uh, becoming an increasingly familiar reference point within marketing circles. It has for a number of years. Some big names, guys like Seth Godin, like to talk about how brands should embrace story more, because for, for ideas to, to really fly, for them to spread like viruses, to, to take on momentum and mass, there's really no better way than a story, because people like stories, uh, and they remember stories, and, and they retell stories, and that's effective communication in anyone's book, and it's why... Uh, it's why thinkers like Malcolm Gladwell and Stephen Levitt uh, are partly um, are such successful authors because they approach non-fiction theories uh, and they wrap them in anecdote and story. Uh, and that's, uh, that makes social sciences and economics so much more accessible for everybody else. And it's why one of my favourite writers, Michael Lewis, um, is so brilliant, in my opinion, because he can take a subject uh, such as baseball and statistics and approach it almost like a thriller writer, which is why then he can write a book on baseball and statistics and it becomes optioned by a big Hollywood movie studio and turned into a movie starring Brad Pitt. So, without question, I think, uh, and without challenge, Brand should tell more stories. And the reason being, very simply, is that the alternative is to advertise. And we know how people tend to feel about advertising. Uh, as the line goes, uh, if you talk to people the way advertising talks to people, you might likely get punched in the face. And nobody, of course, wants to get punched in the face. Um, and that goes doubly so of brands. I think, I think it's a particularly telling um, experience when you look at the actual dictionary definition of advertising. To advertise, the verb, 
by its own definition, is to bring attention to something in an ostentatious or boastful manner uh, in a public medium uh, to induce people to buy it for the hard sell. Uh, boastful, ostentatious, these are not particularly attractive qualities, they're not particularly likeable qualities, they're not the kind of qualities that you sort of search out in other human beings and then want to make those human beings your friends. So advertising by its own dictionary definition is actually really rather unlikable. Whereas, whereas stories, stories can convince and they can persuade. So this, I have a confession, this may be a thinly veiled attempt to place on my favourite advertising, but I assure you it is illustrative. Uh, and those illustrations sit within uh, three sections that I'd like us to kind of walk through this morning. Um, and following the kind of classic conventions of storytelling, it's a three-act structure. In Act One, um, I want to talk about the fact that really this is nothing new at all. And this is all about mythology and how brands tap into that mythology. Uh, in Act Two, that it's actually, to a degree, all about our inner superhero and hero mythology uh, and uh, male archetypes particularly. And then in the spirit of effective communication, I want to undermine everything I said in Act 1 uh, and talk about actually the, how this is all, this is all very new um, and how storytelling in a digital age is providing all sorts of new tools uh, and ways of being able to tell story. So firstly, this is nothing new. And why to a degree is this nothing new? Well, it's because from, from the Greeks, from the Romans, from the Egyptians, from, from the Bible, we have all these stories uh, and they're, they're almost they're passed down like a, like a baton of rolled scroll from generation to generation. And through time, through time they endure. And they're not just stories. They're, uh, they're the foundations of our faith. They're um, the building blocks on which society remains civilized and keeps on the right tracks. They're, they're message carriers, if you like, wrapped in all sorts of meanings to give us understanding into how we see the world, see our potential in, our wo in the world, uh, and gain some sort of meaning and understanding. Um, you know, Icarus, uh, flying too close to the sun, uh, a story about our relationship really uh, with technology and how we should be a better judge of our own potential limitations. Uh, Sisyphus and his boulder, um, you know, a, a punishment, uh, eternal futility for chronic deceitfulness. Uh, Prometheus and the gift of fire, a punishment for actually being uh, over generous and, his, you know, and, and for giving fire to, to mankind, but potentially also it's a story really about betrayal. Uh, Pandora and her box, um, Moses returning from Mount Sinai um, with, with ten tablets of wise instruction, uh, a Greek SWAT team uh, snuggled cosily inside a Trojan horse, rolled blindly into Troy, their, their epic success many years later culminating in the naming of a brand of condom. Uh, and I think the point I'm really trying to make here is that for all this conversation and all this debate around brands needing to tell more stories, actually brands are doing that pretty well already. There's this terrific quote uh, from uh, a British poet uh, called Matthew Arnold. Matthew Arnold was also the brother of Thomas Arnold, who was the pretty famous uh, headmaster of rugby school. For just a little bit of parenthesis and backstory there as well. And Matthew Arnold had this to say, uh, to know the best that is known and thought in the world and by making this known, to create true and fresh ideas. To know that which is known, all the cool stuff, um, and by making it known, consider how to put it together. What Matthew Arnold's really doing here is talking about almost a, kind of a, a source code for originality, how you can bring things together in a new and interesting way. And that's what brands do, or at least that's what they try and do. They take the familiar and they, they look to reinvent it. They, they look to join the dots, existing dots. For want of a, almost a bit of a metaphor, it's almost like a constellation or a star chart. Um, brands look to culture, pop culture, history, and they join the dots to try and create form and shape uh, and meaning and reason where formerly uh, they may not have had any um, in order to slipstream these kind of visual terms, these verbal terms, uh, and as a consequence uh, drive our own sense of familiarity with them and our sense of want for them. Come a couple of uh, classical and quickfire examples. Apple, this is what uh, former Apple employee Jean-Louis Gassi had to say about his company's uh, bite-afflicted fruit motif. Uh, one of the deep mysteries to me is our logo, the symbol of lust and knowledge, bitten into, all crossed with the colours of the rainbow in the wrong order. You couldn't dream of a more appropriate logo. Lust, knowledge, hope, anarchy. These are some very deep-seated associations that, that you know, Apple, through its motif of the, of the Apple, Apple logo, are really playing around with. 
Uh, anarchy is also why the L in Google is green, uh, Ruth Ketter of Google. There are a lot of different color iterations, but we ended up with the primary colors. Uh, and instead of having the pattern go in order, we put a secondary color on the L, uh, which brought back the idea that Google doesn't follow all the rules. Now, you might be thinking those crazy kids at Google for making their L green. Um, it's a bit oblique. Um, it's a bit opaque. But I like the fact that there is a rationale to it. I like the fact that there is, a, there is an underlying backstory. Uh, when Hyundai launched their premium uh, luxury brand, they, um, they drew on the first book of the Bible for their range, the Genesis. When, when VW launched their premium luxury brand, um, they called it Phaeton. Now, Phaeton means shining. Uh, but Phaeton was also the son of Helios. Helios was the sun god. And, and actually, the story goes that, that Phaeton borrowed Helios, his father's sun chariot, lost control of the reins, started to veer too close to earth and smote entire continents and Zeus had to shoot him out of the sky with a lightning bolt. Um, so with a slight sprinkling of irony, VW have also named their luxury brand after a joyriding teenager. Uh, but at the same time, it also means shining. A little more irony, if you live in the US, you can stream music from the website Pandora. If you live outside the US, you get greeted with this front page uh, saying that because of licensing constraints, we apologize, but you can't stream music. The lawyers have no problem actually keeping a lid on Pandora. Uh, for the uh, branding of movie studios, the manufacturers of storytelling, we have, we have mythical creatures and mythical kingdoms, winged horses. Uh, and, uh, and magical scapes. For a global coffee shop, we have uh, associations with a, with a topless, twin-tailed siren who was known to enchant sailors to their watery end. Uh, for an Italian fashion house, we have associations with a snake-headed lady with a stony stare. And the point is that any set of cultural reference points can be reworked, reinvented to take on new meaning from something scary to something actually potentially quite desirable, which is exactly what Matthew Arnold was talking about. Consider very quickly and briefly the, the brand narrative behind Nike. Nike didn't start off as Nike. Nike started off as Blue Ribbon Sports. Then came the swoosh, and then actually six years after the swoosh, they renamed themselves after the Greek goddess of victory. And then 10 years after that, Dan Wyden of Wyden and Kennedy uh, infamously told his, his Nike clients, you guys at Nike, you know, you just do it. He said it in an American accent, obviously. Um, but the point is, the point is that um, any story narrative can be reworked in the case of Nike. That's a brand narrative 49 years in the telling um, to make it the brand that we know and feel today. So brands tap into myth to build their own sense of narrative and create a sense of meaning for us. By extension, they also look to equip us with the means by which we can actually tell our own stories, build our own personal narratives, uh, and inspire our imagination. Um, which hopefully quite seamlessly takes me into Act 2, that to an extent this is actually all about our inner superhero, particularly for us guys. Um, and so I'd like us for uh, just a couple of minutes to consider hero mythology and to consider uh, the popular appeal of... Uh, heroic uh, male archetypes, guys like uh, James Bond and Jason Bourne. I think Jason Bourne um, is a classic hero archetype going on a classic hero's journey. His is a, um, a journey of self-discovery to learn that he's a highly trained super agent. And most guys on the planet would like to know the stuff Jason Bourne knows. Um, and what we're really talking about here and playing around in is the sort of the waters of childhood and inner childhood. Um, the American child psychologist David Elkind has a label for it. He calls it the personal fable. And he associates the personal fable particularly um, in terms of a period of uh, cognitive and emotional development in particularly early adolescence. Uh, and, and it's about the idea of over-differentiating one's experiences uh, and the feelings one has um, to the point almost of assuming you're just that little bit more unique than everybody else. A person might believe that he is the only one who can experience whatever feelings of joy, horror, misery, or confusion he might encounter. You know, sound familiar? Or it sounds quite familiar to me. Um, of course, we grow out of it a bit, but then there's also the degree to which we regress into it by extent. And I don't think there's anything wrong with these ideas of personal fable and personal narrative. And this plays into the world of kind of role play. Uh, an inner childhood and wish fulfillment. Uh, and this is something that advertising uh, knows all too well and often brands actually address and play to. Now, I think the, the heroic male archetype is a very familiar invention 
to us. It's um, something that's been uh, consistently referenced and taken multiple forms, at least over the last 60, 70 years, right the way from kind of Don Draper's Mad Men, even now to the present. Um, you know, Diet Coke guy, Old Spice Man, The Milk Tray Man, uh, Marlboro Man. These are very familiar archetypal inventions. Um, and they endure, they, they work, uh, they, they convince, and they help be the conduit by which they convince us to actually buy things. And I think there's something very interesting about them in terms of just how robust they are, because even as audiences and a society and culture arguably becomes more sophisticated, um, they're still prevalent. You know, Skyfall was the Bond movie that celebrated its 50th anniversary last year. Um, and even in examples, which I'll come to show in two seconds, um, where... Ultimately, there's a degree of now tongue-in-cheek and a subversion and a knowing wink. Um, we're able to still suspend disbelief around the fact that we know that these are two-dimensional cliches, um, even though we know that the deeper truth of Marlboro Man is that Marlboro Man could never possibly still be with us. But they still work. Um, and it says something. It's a testament to just how powerful and strong these are, are as, as conduits of messages, given that they can be subverted, but they can still endure. Um, this is Bob Peak. Bob Peak is uh, one of my favourite illustrators. Bob Peak is also known as the, the, the father of modern uh, movie posters. But he didn't just produce movie posters. He also uh, was a was a graphic illustrator and commercial artist, and did a lot of advertising, particularly in the sort of fifties, sixties, and seventies. And I think this uh, this 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 place of the visual and verbal language by which things become attractive uh, and playing into heroic narratives or something. Peak, uh, Peak was very familiar with, um, and he was that rare breed of commercial artist where he wasn't a precious artist, and he acknowledged almost the, the prevailing fundamental of any piece of brand messaging or advertising, which is hold your audience, because the minute you've lost your audience, you've lost the potential sell. As he quite rightly said, you know, the minute they turn the page, it's over, and so you do whatever you need to do to actually make sure that they don't turn the page. And what Peak was very good at doing was grafting these very glamorous uh, dynamic, high energy, rather sexy and sassy scenarios onto what are basically product sell advertising, no different to selling Coke Zero from last year. Uh, this is an example of, uh, for 7up, uh, get real action. Uh, Seven up your thirst away. And the, the visual language is so very consistent. It's interesting that, you know, that the image on the left um, predates the, the Steve McQueen movie, The Getaway, that came out then in the early 70s. And you can see how it's playing with that kind of language and that kind of um, escapism uh, and adventure. Uh, and just three examples in total. This is the second one. Winston Cigarettes, Flavor Your Fun Away, which is out the same year uh, that also the Bond movie on a Majesty's Secret Service uh, came out. Uh, thirdly, uh, and this one I, I really am a big fan of, uh, Bob Peake's Diners Club Guy. Uh, Diners Club Guy being this kind of, again, classic male archetype, this sort of strong-lined, cool cat, the kind of character you'd imagine being able to kind of roll with Sinatra and Dean Martin and being a very credible member of, of Ocean's Eleven. Um, and I don't think, although this is talking about the 60s, that it's really any different today. Fast forward the clock 50-some years, and you've got Jude Law, not as Diners Club Guy, but as Dunhill Guy. Um, and the question is, really, I think, um, when you look at these images of Jude, are we really looking at images of Jude? Or are we looking at images of Jude and then actually transposing ourselves into the scene, into the scene of being the one driving the dune buggy um, or wearing the safari suit? Maybe not the safari suit. Um, and I think... This is, again, it, it's, it's an interesting point that uh, a UK uh, planner, a guy called Russell Davis... Uh, labels as the pretending layer, which, which is a lovely expression. Uh, and he talks about how products shouldn't just be about utility, shouldn't just be about what they literally do for you, particularly, say, like computers, but they should be able to contribute to something in terms of how you feel when you're using it. Um, for the emotional feeling of being in the moment of using. It's not just a useful or beautiful or functional object, it's got to make some little nod to who we, you, are pretending to be uh, when you're in that moment for the imaginary me. And I think that's something that the likes of Apple understand superbly well. Their silhouette device, particularly around their, their iPod campaign, um, is really rather brilliant because it's a cipher. It's a cipher by which puts you in the moment and then in the mood, not just of using an iPod and using the product, but the feeling of using the product. Um, 
and I think that there is a, there's a flip to this. There's an interesting polemic from the point of view that while brands look on reference points to authenticate themselves, and by extension they give us and equip us with the means to actually build our own narratives, and which is partly that explains one of the reasons for the huge popularity of social media, um, social media at the same time is then uh, affording and allowing us to build all sorts of online experiences, online identities, almost become the biographers of our own lives. Uh, and there is a, a valid enough criticism that potentially are we developing something like a curator's conceit where the moments that we have aren't authentic, where we are almost detached from the moment and being in the moment, and that they're only really real once we've kind of captured them uh, and uploaded them and tagged them and shared them, and then they're only really validated once somebody's actually liked them. At the same time, what is so terrible with, with a little bit of self-brushing uh, and the idea of wanting to be the, the better, cooler, um, more stylized versions of ourselves, whether it's offline or online. And the, the three-time Bond film director, Lewis Gilbert, once said that the magical, the magical quality of a James Bond movie was that you get to walk out of the theatre just walking that little bit taller for a little while. And I think that's what brands can do, and that's certainly what social media brands are capable of doing. They're, um, they're capable of giving us a little bit of, of extra height. Third and final act, uh, that this is all very new, or at least it has the potential to be very new. Um, on April the 6th, 2010, the Producers Guild of America announced the addition of Transmedia Producer to the uh, Code of Credits. Uh, a big deal that some in Hollywood called unprecedented, and that quite says something for a, a city in which everything is a big deal. Um, but a big deal because it was the first time in the, in the Guild's 60-year history that a, that a new credit had been added to the list. Um, and it was a telling comment on the acknowledgement of transmedia as a piece of thinking and theory. Now, uh, it's been doing the rounds, transmedia storytelling, uh, for seven years now, ever since Henry Jenkins coined it in his uh, 2006 book, Convergence Culture. Um, and Jenkins defines it uh, as storytelling across multiple forms of media, with each element making distinctive contributions to a fan's understanding of the story world. By using different media formats, transmedia creates entry points through which the consumer can be immersed. Different entry points into the story world is afforded by different media formats, something that's more non-linear. It's a good definition, it's a, it's a very good definition, um, but it's a theoretical definition. Um, and I think it's only in the more recent couple of years that transmedia theory has started to actually find a practical stride. Uh, and the reason uh, for, and I'll show you a couple of examples, the reason that those practical strides are starting to happen is because they're actually observing, really, what are the long-standing tenets of any well-told story. Um, they're tenets around, really, toying with us uh, and teasing us and tantalizing us and feeding the imagination. Put another way, we know that the idea of the monster is much more terrifying than the face of the monster. The face of the monster revealed is invariably actually a little bit of a come down. Um, but the monster that, that lives in the dark, in our imagination, livid, you know, growing, growing fat on our, on our fear. Um, that's the truly haunting monster. That's the most terrifying monster of all. Um, and it's why Steven Spielberg, uh, when, he, when he made Jaws, uh, did such an amazing job, because he only revealed the monster, the shark, at the very end of the movie, by which point, you know, you were all the way hooked on the plight of three guys on a boat uh, that needed to be bigger. Um, now, the fact that Spielberg couldn't get the shark to work uh, that it was a, a big, clunky, motorized shark, and when he could eventually get it to work, it could only turn left and not right, which isn't particularly scary, because all you have to do is swim clockwise. Um, that, that's sort of Hollywood folklore. Um, but no question, Spielberg was terrified of the shark, not because it looked terrifying, but because it looked ridiculous. And he feared that audiences would see through the illusion he was trying to create, you know, the illusion of, of fear. And as he said himself, quite interestingly, um, it made me become more like Alfred Hitchcock, to tease, to make a the less you see, the more you get thriller. Um, and that's really partly the essence of, of what excellent transmedia into practice is all about. To Firstly, very analog examples, one actually from a couple of years ago, uh, for the movie District 9, uh, the movie about alien invasion in South Africa, which has really got an apartheid theme. And there was a series of 
bus seats, bus shelter pop-up seats that um, smattered all around West Hollywood um, that were again referencing the movie a good three months before the movie came out on theatrical release that again were, were playing into this notion of, of alien occupation and segregation and really the underlying apartheid theme within it. A couple of years uh, down the line, 2011, the movie Limitless with, with De Niro and Bradley Cooper and the first teasing of this uh, took the form of a series of tube card panel adverts. Uh, not for the movie, but for the main plot device in the movie, something called a clear pill. A uh, simple pill that you swallow that would give you a four-digit uh, four IQ. Um, and there they are on, on the Bakerloo line in this instance, you know, along uh, and next to all these adverts for uh, tablets of uh, computer devices and tablets for vitamin tablets. Um, with no real explicit reference to the movie at all. But there, there they are as potential ways of entering into the story universe on an oblique level. Much more ambitious and far-sweeping, if you take Christopher Nolan um, and what he got involved in for the third installment of his Batman trilogy, The Dark Knight Rises, uh, which was very ambitious, but ultimately Nolan felt that he could you know, fan the flames of, of fanboy frenzy and online cyber chatter for an entire 12 months before the movie came out in theatres. It started shooting on May the 19th of 2011, and he was so mindful of what he was trying to do, the very first day of the shooting, there he is taking photos of some of his main cast, people like Tom Hardy, who played the main baddie, Bane, um, and he's uploading it the very next day, online, uh, associated with the hashtag the fire rises to get things going to start to create a certain momentum and tap into these early influencer audiences uh, two months within inside of two months of the first shoot he'd uploaded his first teaser trailer a minute and a half trailer where actually and I did this I counted it there's less than 30 seconds of actual new footage and it was poor footage but the the spin-off posts and the spin-off video content and the spin-off commentary on the likes of YouTube were ridiculous you have people fans doing 10 minute dissections on these kind of postmodern critiques of a trailer where there was only 30 seconds in it anyway um, so it's a whole 12 month runway into ultimately the release of the film I think probably for me last year um, the launch of Prometheus was one of the best, if not the most exceptional example of transmedia storytelling so far. Um, it took the form ostensibly more than anything else of three viral films. Three viral films. The first was um, with Guy Pearce uh, in character as Peter Wheeland in a partnership they did with Ted where uh, Peter Wheeland did an address to Ted in the future, to Ted 2023, how his character he announced with, with great ego and uh, sweeping scale was going to change the world. Uh, then two months later, there was this lovely two and a half minute corporate video uh, from the Whelan Corporation uh, advertising and announcing the existence of their eighth generation Android. A wonderful little store in itself and a really kind of cool and creepy vibe. Uh, and then a couple of months after that, you had uh, the actress Naomi Rappis uh, in character as Dr. Elizabeth Shaw making this video appeal to Guy Pearce's character, Peter Whelan, saying, I need money to go into space to find God. These were fabulous entry points, oblique entry points into the world of the story. They're actually effectively set you know, a good 90 years before Prometheus was set. They were, they were backstories to the backstory, Prometheus being a backstory prequel to the Alien franchise. And if there's any criticism at all of them, um, and there is some criticism, I'm afraid, is that they actually raised expectation too high. They were, they were wonderful pieces of teasing. The actual movie itself was okay. Um, it commercially did all right. Um, but if anything, the expectation led to a little bit of a come down. But I don't think that's any, ever anything one can be afraid of. Um, there's nothing wrong with trying to raise expectations as high as possible. Fundamentals are simply that great stories will always be great stories. Uh, and great storytellers will always be great storytellers. And they'll have the ability to uh, pull our strings and to, and to feed our imagination. Uh, and that will never change. But I think what is changing beyond question is the means we have to now tell our stories. To tell our stories in a digital age um, that makes things much more lively uh, and uh, it's a much broader in invitation. Now, the Mariana Trench in the, in the Western Pacific is the deepest part of the world's oceans. It goes down to a depth of seven miles, seven miles vertically straight down. And to this depth we've explored, uh, but we don't actually know how deep the Mariana Trench goes or, or what's down there. 
And I think digital storytelling, or storytelling within our digital age, is a bit like the Mariana Trench. It's an unknown, a hidden depth, uh, there to explore. There to explore by which we can um, conceive of new stories and conceive and, uh, and discover new monsters. Uh, some of whom, unlike Jaws, can actually turn right as well as left. Uh, and I think our opportunity, our invitation as, as, uh, as brand builders, uh, as effective communicators, as storytellers, our opportunity and invitation is to uh, look to turn the water just a little bit bloody. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening.